all lines of mysticism, and various schools, practices, and such, have a shared overarching foundation, which is self-mastery. The Kabbalah, of course, is not distinct, we might say, from any of the other bodies. And today we're going to discuss one such practice, particularly Bitul Hayesh, which is, we might say, the beginning of supernal mastery in this regard. Bitul Hayesh is roughly seen as the nullification of the self, or we might say the annihilation of the something. Essentially, it is a betterment practice formed by a Mr. Magid of Mezarik, but this term was coined by his student Schneer Zulman. So an overview, we should know in advance that the nullification of the self is more essentially the conquest of the higher spirit over the lower. In a sense, this is the mind over the matter, or the man over the animal, to give some similarities. For those of you who are adjusted to general occult talks, or at least hermeticism, we would call this depolarization, quite simply enough. However, there's a lot going on here from a Kabbalistic perspective, so we'll be splitting the subject into the metaphysical and also the practice itself. And then, lastly, the Zohar. So we will have, essentially, three major segments. A, we might say, what, how, and why. The Kabbalah creation paradox, known as yesh me'ayin ayin me'yesh, means something from nothing and nothing from something. Essentially, critically thinking, we might say this something is pertinent to the nullification or annihilation of the something of Batul Hayesh, and to a certain extent we are absolutely correct. To fully understand the phrase, we should look into it a little bit further, into what we might call the mythical genesis. Essentially, from the human perspective, from the experiencing individual perspective, the divinity is an immense nothingness. Uh, most Kabbalists would be familiar with Ain, and we can cognitively understand this incorporeal form as this immense nothingness, when in actuality, from the divine perspective, it is the whole something, and it made nothing. The nothing was created, so to say, by an engraving. It is typically called the hard spark, and we might imagine a space being pushed, in a sense, to create a cavity. Something within yet outside of the divine form that made room for something other than the totality of the divinity. That was the something, the divinity, making the nothing in that cavity, of which everything else would eventually come to unfold in that space. This is typically seen as the central point in circles, or the circle emphasis Kabbalistic diagrams. Uh, this central space tends to be equated with the actual point of engraving. In another way, it is also at the very, very end, up at the tip, and it is described as the totality of the divine essence, the something, funneling its way down through a small channel that hits the center of this space, filling it, which is why we experience all of this as, we might say, a physical and metaphysical reality. But I think you understand now why it's considered paradoxical, because it deals with perspective. So why are we talking about this, you might wonder? We haven't really explained what the something is, and to do so, we're going to go to Rabbi Yehuda Ashlag, uh, Baal HaSulam, specifically on his introduction to the Zohar. Uh, we're going to go to section 7. There and it says, The desire to receive is not found in the divine, because from whom should he receive? The desire to receive is the something that was created from the nothing. So, going back to the matter of perspective, let's think about this metaphysical scenario. This engraving is made, this cavity, 
And because from the Ayin Meyesh perspective, the nothing from something, we now have a space that can be filled and in its generation, the ability of, we might say, an expression of reception is already capable of occurring because now we have two spaces. One that is full and has no need for anything, and one that experiences lack. Uh, that's not the ideal way to explain that, but I think you see what I'm saying. So now it has not only a capacity to receive, but a willingness or interest in reception because it's not completed, it's not full. So, how does this relate to us? The point is, Betul Hayesh, this annihilation of the desiring self, the something, is particular to the individual, not necessarily the whole metaphysical state. And what it deals with is the capacity, we might say, to tailor oneself and to experience a certain form of existence where you have control, uh, we might call it a more fulfilled expression of will. Not only that, Kabbalistically, we step into the example of the mirrors. Now, the mirrors are quite complex, and they have very particular scenarios which uh, they are more pertinent. But in this case, it actually helps us understand better the elevation process relative to Betul Hayesh. In section 8 of the same from Baal HaSulam's Introduction to the Zohar, if their desires have similarity of form, they connect. As the divine has no desire to receive, the idea is that as you nullify the desire to receive within oneself, or at least express a certain level of control, you are cleaving to the divinity. Of course, there's more that goes into it, but uh, it is described as a cleaving. We are coming closer, and the reason we're closer is because you're mimicking the divine form, at least from a philosophical standpoint. And this mimicry of innate nature, we might say of intention and desire, is supposed to be, by perspective of the Kabbalist, intrinsically elevating. As in, you open up a space to reflect the divine form above through yourself into the lower. Because that is the means, we might say, a spiritual manifestation to embody it a bit more wholly. Not in some uh, one-off type of presence-related scenario, but more of a purification. In fact, Freemasonry does a good job of expressing this mentality with their rough ashlar and perfected ashlar type of analogies, these ideas of getting rid of superfluities, uh, constricting oneself, binding oneself up to be, we might say, less reactionary. We've spoken on the overarching metaphysics from a couple of perspectives. We've talked about the idea of the elevation and the we might even say cosmological genesis that led up to it. And now we can go into the how. How exactly are we going to get to a point, a, we might say, prepared state for something along the lines of Betul Hayesh, and intrinsically also be engaging in it? Fortunately, it's quite simple. While you'll understand this better after the Zohar portion of the video, we're going to begin by addressing the actual practice. When we look at the Tree of Life, we know that there are particular distinctions in its spaces and how it relates to the human being. While some believe that this is entirely a hermetic, or we even might say general occult perspective on the matter, that is entirely untrue. So, what we're going to do is work from the bottom up. We're going to handle, we might say, the Malchuth of ourselves. We're going to handle the midot, or the midsection, the emanations of emotional expression. And then lastly, we'll handle the top, as in the intelligences. Essentially, what I mean is malchut is going to be what we do, what we choose to do, and how we engage in things. Yet, in the midot, we're going to be controlling our feelings. When those two, the emotional aspects and the choice of action come together, this is what we would normally say is a person's reaction, as in their reactivity and ease of influence from external sources. This is the first big step. Uh, 
which is commonly categorized among the Yasold space. Now, controlling what you do is rational enough, but realistically controlling how you feel is a complex matter, because what it requires is the upper space, rather the intelligences. You can attempt to reason, or give yourself a level of, we might say, peaceability in your mind, and push it throughout the rest of the body, hoping to negate harsh emotional feelings, or some such, that lead to lesser action. Yet, can we really control what we think? From the Kabbalistic standpoint, the expression of self-will will just go with Kether, expressing the idea of self-willed existence, as in I am, uh, of oneself versus the idea of the divinity, we're not going that far. What we're saying is that your willingness to be and to express itself upon the lower, as in to impression itself into the world, we're going to put that in Kether and describe it as our force of will resting over even our own thoughts. But that didn't really answer the question, did it? How would a person change their thoughts? So we're going to use a little bit of an analogy. Just imagine that your entirety of being is like a large beehive. What you choose to do, how you reflect yourself and control your own emotions, which then lesser are also going to control how you act, and they work their way back up, you have variety of thoughts. And the variety of thoughts are going to affect everything that's beneath it. Now, we might say that each thought, action, feeling is like a cell in this beehive. And what we do is when you have an open space, you fill it with what is proper. To fill it with what is proper, you have to begin with noting what is going to be beneficent based on, you know, a particular line of right action. From a Kabbalistic perspective, this is likely going to be the Torah approach, keeping mitzvahs, and that's going to allude to the idea of tilling and keeping in Genesis, which you'll note later. So, we might say that we're putting honey into these honeycombs by putting the what has been rationally set out as the proper attributes and what will occur is that it will we might say over accumulate and drip out of the cells as the cells are not infinitely capable of holding honey they have a, a limited capacity of expression which we can just see as the limitation of the human experience and the universe therefore it will drip out the excess, and that is what we might call generosity, because it will express itself or spread itself out into the physicality of other people's experiences. In fact, all these little pieces, if you think about it, a person who does well or acts just, affects the people directly around them, and that is in a sense the reception of that excess, even in small amounts. We're going to discuss the Zoharic side of this philosophy, as it is similar, but it has a couple of little details that might have been missed otherwise. It says in section 24, subsection 259, just going to use the Berg translation, And Hashem Elohim took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden. And it's posed as a question, from where did he take him, the man? Where was he before? he was in the Garden of Eden. Now, why this might seem a little more surprising, because they are specifically talking about Adam who was formed, and we know that the formation existing within the Midot is below the supernal triad, so in a sense you might call this crossing the abyss, funnily enough. But it says, Rabbi Shimon Amah took him from the four elements of separation, as in, he took him from the formative and the worldly, and elevated him beyond that, into what we perceive as the negatively existent. However, keep in mind the Ayin and Yesh, Yesh Me Ayin paradoxical scenario. To expand, it says in subsection 260, 
Hakarosh Baruch Hu will take him from Bria, Yetzirah, and Asiya of separation, and about them it is written, from thence it was parted. From thence it was parted, alluding to the four streams of the river that keep the entirety of lower creation sustained. So, what happened is he, Adam, was detached from the lust of the worlds of separation because separation alludes to the nature of the klipot as in there are ignorances there are shells there are spaces for improper understanding and wrong action i mean the klipot are pretty complex in that matter and we'll talk about it eventually however he detached them or him from their lusts as in his desiring nature was removed from such places and he was placed in his own garden. And it says that he is as master over his own body or the worlds of separation within himself. And he is put into this garden to till it and to keep it. And then he waters and sustains them, his own elements of separation, as is seen fit, because that is the nature of full expression of self-control. And it says lastly that those elements of separation know him as their master just as people in a sense from a spiritual context are parts of a greater whole this has been river at the nimiton and i thank you for joining me i hope you've enjoyed this basic overview of batol hayesh and can begin to engage in some kabbalistic practices as always a massive thank you to my friends patrons and supporters i appreciate you more than you know <laughs>